Thank you for joining us in our study tonight of the book of Ephesians. We began several weeks ago. We sort of have an overview of the book, and then we went into chapter one. And the emphasis was what God has done and what Jesus has done and how the Holy Spirit works in this great story of redemption. We then looked at Paul's prayer, and when he talks about uh, hope, he talks about power, uh, he talks about inheritance. And really this, this uh, prayer laid the groundwork for what he did afterwards. We move then into chapter two in the first 10 verses, man's in bad shape. He's in really bad shape, but God has answered the prayer. And he's been able to raise up these people who uh, were dead. So it's really a, a good news or bad news, good news story in the first uh, 10 verses. We move now into uh, the latter part of chapter two. We begin in verse 11. Verse 11 is interesting because it contains the only imperative verb in the first three chapters. You remember early on, we talked to you about this book is divided into two sections. Uh, the first three chapters, he talks about man's redemption of how God was able to achieve it. Uh, then the latter part, beginning in chapter four, verse one, talks about how these people who are redeemed should live. And so the contrast, as far as grammar is concerned, is the first three chapters, you have statements of fact. Here's what you are. You're washed, you're redeemed, you're saved, or whatever it might be. And then in chapter four, he talks about the imperatives of how you then ought to have these things in your life. He continues the story then of redemption uh, in verse 11. And he says, remember. Now it's difficult when you read a text to, to notice the, the emphasis that must be going on here. I don't know if Paul said, you need to remember, or he says, remember. You need to understand, if you don't remember, and that's why he changed it to the imperative. If you don't remember, from whence you have come, you do not appreciate where you are. And that's what he does in this great section. God is going to show his power, uh, not only in how he raised us up in the first 10 verses, but also now how he's shown his power in bringing both Jew and Gentile together in one body. Reconcile. Now that's very important because that'd be very difficult. We have seen that today in our own world. How, how do you reconcile races together? How do you bring people together who come together with two different worldviews? And that's really what you have in the reconciling and bringing together both Jew and Gentile. So what does he say? Verse 11, therefore, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember that formerly you, churches up and down the Lycus Valley, you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcision. Now that, you might as well call them pagans because that's what it meant. To be uh, an acceptable Jew, you had three basic uh, characteristics. You observed the Sabbath, the food laws, and circumcision. Those were the marks. And that's why when you look at the New Testament, uh, those issues surface many times. They surface in the Gospels. They surface in the Epistles, because that's what made a Jew a Jew. Then he says, you're uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. And that is, at that time, that time you were separate. There was a wall built up from Christ. You had no relationship with him. And on top of that, you were excluded. Excluded from citizenship in Israel. You didn't have, you were not part of it. You were the outsider. And you were foreigners. You were foreigners from the covenants of promise that were not given to you. You were without hope. Remember his mentioning of hope in the prayer in chapter one? Here it is again. He wants you to know hope because at one time you had no hope. You were in a hopeless situation. But not only that, you were without God. Literally, this is the term atheist. You had no God. 
You had no God in this world, but then a transition takes place. Look at verse 13. But here's a transitional place. We've seen one earlier. You remember back up in uh, chapter 2 and verse 4? But because of God's great love, here it is again. Here's a contrast. Bad situation. But he says, but now, presently, we've been talking about the past. Let's talk about the present. But now in Christ, and here's the emphasis throughout this book on in him, in whom, in Christ. That will be a strong stress for Paul. But in Christ, Jesus, you once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Central in Paul's understanding of redemption is the blood of Christ. He might talk about the cross of Christ. He might talk about crucifixion. But all these are central for Paul when he talks about reconciliation. Then he says, for he in himself is our peace. Peace is important to Paul. He'll mention it again down in verse 15. Come on down to verse 17. You'll find it again. He's our peace. We're no longer at war. He is our peace, and he's taken these two groups that really didn't have a lot in common together. He's taken these two groups, and what has he done? He's made these two groups one. This one is a reconciliation. Now, we'll come into contact with this again when we get to chapter 4. We talked about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and so on. But here again, you find a, a hint about it. God has done something. He has made these one, has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. What separated you, God then has taken care of, and he set it aside in his flesh, the law and his commandments and his regulations. That which separated you, God by his power has taken it away. Because his purpose was to create. Again, I urge you to watch this word create for Paul. It's so very important. You saw it back in chapter 2 and verse 10. You see it again, and you'll see it several other times in this book. For his purpose, his intent, was to create in himself one new humanity. One new humanity out of two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both them to God through, again, the cross. God has made something new. Now, there are two words uh, in the New Testament that have a little bit different connotation, and we do it in English, too. We talk about, I got a new car, or I got a new dress, or got a new gun, or whatever it is. In other words, newness then sometimes can be new in point of time. But we can use the word new also in point of quality. If we say something is new, we could indicate that it's never ever been done before. Now these are two different Greek words. It's not for sure, but the connotation is that he switches to this word new, which means not new in point of time but new in point of quality. In other words, what God is doing with Jew and Gentile in one body, not only has it just been done recently, but it's never ever been done in all the world. Paul is showing the significance of what God is doing. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Probably Paul doesn't mean necessarily that Jesus did this, but he did this. He was commissioned by Jesus to the Gentiles in his conversion. The Lord emphasized that he was going to be 
a missionary to the Gentiles. You find in chapter 13, when he wasn't accepted in the synagogue, he turned now to the Gentiles, his work and his ministry, he realized that it was for this reason for which he was called. And through him, verse 18, through him we both have access to the Father. Both of us have access to the Father, not just one of them, but by both by one spirit. The idea of reconciliation of Jew and Gentile together in one body was a very, very tough idea for the Jews especially to swallow. When Paul is trying to deal with the church in Rome, he's dealing with trying to how to unite a Jew-Gentile church so they can work together. He does a number of things, but one of the things he does in chapter 11 is he points out that you're together in the same tree, the olive tree, both Jew and Gentile stand together. And so in other words, you can't boast about the other one. And so the idea of reconciliation, Jew and Gentile, Paul had to deal with this on a number of occasions, and he deals with it very effectively here with basically a Gentile audience. Consequently, verse 19, as a result of this, you're no longer foreigners. You're no longer foreigners. And you're no longer strangers, but you're fellow citizens with God's people. Do you see how you have changed from what you used to be back up in verse 12? You see, what he's saying now in this verse, it's a contrast to what he said you were in verse 12. And the only way you could have done this was by the power of God. Your fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. You're part of his family. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. With Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Verse 21, in him, not outside of him. Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. You see the emphasis again on the Lord. Verse 22. And in him, you two were being built together to become a dwelling, a tent, a house, a tabernacle in which God lives by his spirit. Paul's strong rabbinical understanding and education put upon him a strong emphasis on God. He knew the statements found several times in Torah. Be holy as I am holy. But now he comes down to the Christian. And his emphasis is going to be that you have a connection with God that you didn't have before. You see, before you were an atheist, you were without God. But that's not true now. Later on, when he gets to the practical sections, Chapter 5 and verse 1, he'll talk about that we need to be imitators. We need to be mimickers of God. So hopefully you're seeing now in these first, in these first three chapters the importance of the foundation that he's going to lay with the practical section beginning in chapter 4. And so these reframes are very important. And Paul is very concerned that they understand from whence they have come. That will be the basis for them to go. They're gonna sit with him, walk with him, and stand with him. Chapter three, we'll talk about how Paul got himself involved in this and what his part was and bringing about this great plan that God had from eternity past. Thank you.
for joining. And I hope it lays a foundation for some good discussion on Wednesday night. And uh, be sure to look at your outline and read that what Paul has done is very, very important to us. Thank you very much. Goodbye. God bless.